Welcome everyone to Caleb Watches Movies, the channel where I, Caleb, randomly select one of the many movies that I own and I watch and review them for you. But today, well, we are coming to the end of 2019. And like I do every single year, there is a certain genre that I always look forward to, and that is the big comic book superhero genre every single year. And for the past several years, really ever since 2016, we have had a, a plethora of superhero comic book movies. And yes, I do know what that word means. But superheroes, it's the big blockbuster genre of the movie theaters. It's what's keeping people coming to the movie theater. So since we are coming to the end of 2019, as tradition on my channel, I am ranking every single film that came out this year that fits into the comic book superhero genre. And surprisingly, there are 13 films that came out this year that falls within that category. Some of them, you can say, have been the best of the genre so far. And as tradition, of course, of course, there are several stinkers. Now, of course, this is my personal ranking. This is not a definitive, this is the be-all, end-all listing of all the superhero films that came out this year. And if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. That's not what this channel is about. I welcome conversation. I welcome debate. But I welcome that debate from people that have actually seen these movies. Ooh, I don't know if that's a little bit of a spoiler. But I'm excited to get to the top of this list, but in order to get to the top, we have to start at the bottom. And boy, do we have some doozies. Starting off the list at number 13 is Fast Color. Yeah, who saw that one? It's a small, independent film that had a quiet release, didn't really make a lot of money. And I had heard that this film was coming out and it was being released last year, but I, I never saw it. And I put it on my list for this year, thinking that, oh, this is probably going to be one of those films that, yes, they're shooting, but it's never going to see the light of day. And then in one of my trips to Walmart, I see that this came out on Blu-ray. So I was thinking, yay, I get to see this independent film. And then I watched it and I went, no, I wish I wouldn't have. This is your stereotypical post-apocalyptic world. Uh, th there's a shortage on water, and for some reason there are people in this world that now have powers. I think that they were genetically created in a lab somewhere. I don't know. This film doesn't really go into any detail. We focus on this woman who is on the run from this strange, creepy scientist that meets up with her in a diner. And she finds her mother, who is caring for actually her daughter, so we have three generations of superheroes here. And their superpower is the PowerPoint animation dissolve, just with colors. And it's fast. It's not really fast, though. It's actually pretty slow and pretty boring. I had heard such great things about this. It has a great Rotten Tomatoes score. So watching it and seeing the product of what was being shown to me, I was severely disappointed. This film has a scene, just randomly, where the one bad guy meets up with the leader of the bad guys, the big corporate people, in the middle of a desert. They're not meeting at a diner or a building somewhere, just randomly in the desert, and they stop to face each other, and they're cheating out because they know there's a camera there recording it, to where the villain is talking about why they're chasing them. Of course, they would know why they're chasing them. They're the bad guys. They're a part of this situation. They're only doing this for the audience. It's cheap. It's cheesy. It's stupid. It's long. It's boring. You don't give a shit about these characters. You have no idea what's happening most of the time in this movie, and it supposedly sets it up for a sequel that we are never going to see, thank God. At number 12, of course, it had to be this slow X-Men Dark Phoenix. When you talk about films that came out in 2019, when you're talking about the films that are the most disappointing, this film has to be at the top of that list. This was the X-Men according to the world of Fox. This was their last hurrah before they get taken over by Disney and Marvel Studios and they start doing the MCU version of the X-Men. So we get to see our favorite actors playing these characters one last time. How could it go wrong? Well, it could very easily go wrong because they're just trying to repeat X-Men 3, The Last Stand. What these people's obsession is with the Dark Phoenix saga, I have no idea. Because if you've read that series of comics, it is not a good series. And then you go watch X-Men The Last Stand, and that was not a good movie. However, given the choice to watch between X-Men The Last Stand and Dark Phoenix, I will gladly take X-Men The Last Stand because at least that one had a small sense of fun. There is none of that here. How we were able to get these actors, James McAvoy, Jennifer Lawrence, Michael Fassbender, all of them to come back for this movie, 
It's mind-boggling. This is the script that you gave them? It's all paint-by-number stuff that we had seen before, and a lot of it didn't make sense at all. This film overall just felt like a write-off. Yes, yes, let's make it, because we're trying to keep it in production. We don't want to give it over to Marvel. But hey, look, Marvel and Disney, they bought all of our shit. Oh, well, now we got to put it out again. It's just, it felt like that type of mindset with it. Jessica Chastain shows up as the villain of this movie, and I am almost certain that they were supposed to be a different type of comic book character. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure the end product was not supposed to be what they were. With a franchise that has such great hits like X2, X-Men United, uh, Logan, Deadpool, First Class, Days of Future Past, for it to end like this, it is very disappointing and it leaves a bad taste in your mouth, and I feel sorry for everyone involved. Next up at number 11 comes a small independent film called Supervise! Oh, Tommy! Because in the ever-growing catalog about superheroes and comic book stories, what haven't we done? Oh yes, let's do superheroes in a retirement home. This film is cheesy as hell, and you know what? I actually found it to be a little charming. Starring names like Tom Berenger and Bo Bridges, this film is about these group of superheroes way past their prime in this retirement home, and all of a sudden they find that someone is stealing all of their powers. Hmm, I wonder who it could be. The story concept I actually think is pretty cute and pretty charming. The quality of the film that we got, well, the costumes are pretty lackluster. The setting is pretty simple, but the idea of seeing all these old-timer superheroes just trying to live out one last glory day, I think is very charming, and I actually like this movie. At number 10 is probably one of the biggest bombs of 2019, just in general, Hellboy! A film that was obliterated by everyone. It made no money, the Rotten Tomato scores is crap, the audience score is crap, but yet because of all those low expectations when I finally see this movie, I'm thinking it's okay. If this came out in the early 90s, I think we would all be saying this is pretty good. It actually has some pretty terrifying stuff in it. Like the witch with the one eye was doing all the crazy exorcist walk. I was actually freaked out at. But I know all the drama that was happening behind this movie. Guillermo del Toro was trying to make Hellboy 3 to wrap up his Hellboy trilogy, and the studio didn't want to give him any money, which is very weird because he just won the Academy Award for Best Director and Best Picture with The Shape of Water, and he wanted something like $250 million to make that movie. And the studio, looking at the box office returns of the first two Hellboys, was like, nah, we're not gonna do that. So they went for a lower budget version of the story that rebooted everything, and it still cost a lot of freaking money. The plot here, it's a little confusing, but there is, there's King Arthur, and there's Merlin, and there's Excalibur. So it's your typical Excalibur tale, and you have to get the sword to kill the woman, and ha! All I know is that I had a sense of where this movie was going, and the quality of stuff I was going to get in the first five minutes when Excalibur first shows himself, and Mia Jolovitz goes, Excalibur! <laughs> oh no! Coming in at number 9 is a film that I actually forgot was based on a comic book source material, and that was Mission Impossible International. Starring Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson, and you know what? I actually had a surprisingly good time with this movie. If you go back and watch any of the other Men in Black films, you can tell that they are very cheesy, the visual effects are pretty much subpar, and the plot, the, the pacing of the movie, is very, very fast. And we get two great actors here that prove that they have great chemistry with each other, Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson. Tessa Thompson is delightful. I hope that she goes on to do such big things, and just does everything. I want her in everything. Same thing with Chris Hemsworth. That guy is so frickin' charming. If anything, this movie proves that he would make a very good James Bond. Not like the parkour Daniel Craig version, but if we ever wanted to go back to the Roger Moore version of James Bond, where it's more quippy, and a lot more fun, Chris Hemsworth would be great. Liam Neeson shows up here, he runs the International Men in Black League, or, or a company, or whatever it's called. So let's see, Liam Neeson is in this movie, so he's either going to play a father figure that dies off too quickly, or he's going to play a father figure that turns out to be the villain in the end. For those of you that haven't seen it, what do you think is going to happen? Next up on the list comes a film based on a graphic novel, The Kitchen. What do you think happens when a couple of cops bust a couple of mobsters? Do you think that puts an end to that mob's crime? No, because they forgot to take into effect 
They have wives, and wives get shit done. If this movie is great for anything, it's great for the showcase of empowerment that these three women find. Their husbands get carted off to jail for several years, and they're trying to support their family and where they're living. They're trying to put food on the table, and they don't know how to do that because they never had to worry about that. So they start their own crime ring. And in the movie, it's... It, actually seems pretty easy, and sometimes they rely on the hey, we're women doing a man's job thing a little too much. The film opens where the song, and, and this is paraphrasing, but it's saying something like, It's a man's world! It's a man's world! But a man ain't nothing without a woman! Oh, and a woman makes a man, and a man can't be anything without a woman! Oh. I am not kidding the first Five minutes, it's this song where all it says is like, It's a bad world, and a man needs a woman or a hair. Trey Parker and Matt Stone would be very proud. A lot of the plot points are convenient, but I love the cinematography here. I love how dark and gritty this film is. Again, I love the show of empowerment that this film promotes. And you get an amazing performance from Melissa McCarthy. She has some very tough scenes in this movie, and she pulls it off tremendously. Coming in at number seven was the film that started off the superhero genre for the year of 2019, coming from Shamalama Ding Dong, Glass. The greatly anticipated conclusion to Unbreakable and Split, surprisingly Split, was a movie placed in the unbreakable world, and it was, we were so excited for Glass! And what we got was... It's okay. When we typically think superheroes and supervillains, we think of a big climactic event that happens at the end, or at least towards the end of the movie, where there's this big set piece and there's a huge battle that happens. And for where this film ends, it doesn't go there. It goes the traditional M. Night Shyamalan and Ding Dong route, where there's a fun little twist at the end. But when you take this movie and you compare it to a films like Unbreakable and Split, this one is definitely the weaker of the three because those films had a sense of, of freshness, of un knowingness. We had no idea where those stories were going. Whereas when this film starts, we already have these characters that have already been established in these other films, and we just go straight into the plot. And that's really not where Shyamalan Ding Dong excels. He excels in building tension, and having us learn who these people are, and what their situation is, and discovering all the twists along the way. Really, in the first ten minutes, we get our first battle between Bruce Willis and James McAvoy. The ending, I actually don't mind at all. It, it Everything about this movie, it makes sense how it plays out. Just, again, when you compare it to those first two, and maybe some people think that's unfair, you should grade this film just on its own, but it's hard not to when it's part of this trilogy, the surprise trilogy, that um, Shemalama Ding Dong was building up to be so great. Coming in at number six, if you like the philosophical questions that were being asked in the movie Man of Steel, then I think that you would love this movie called Brightburn, a film that was being hailed as a horror film with Superman. Yeah, that's basically it. What happens if this alien boy that has all the powers in the world comes crashing down to Earth and they don't meet up with fantastic parents like Martha and Jonathan Kent? You could possibly get a situation like this, where the kid doesn't have those strong morals just pounded into his chest and pounded into his DNA. Someone says something mean to him at school, or if he gets bullied at school, he's gonna take him out. And I think it's a great question to ask. It's a great side of the coin to look at. And for the most part, I was extremely entertained with this movie. But the initial turn that we get from Brightburn, I want it to be more internalized. I want it to be more of his choice being made. Something happens early on in the story where the ship that is coming out of the barn was throwing some weird message or something that turned a switch on in his head, and that's when all these killings and weird happenings started. And I'm like, oh, no, come on, make that, make him choose to be evil. That's what I want to see, and that's, that's the envelope that I want to see pushed. And sadly, it just turns into your stereotypical horror film with a lot of jump scares, but the jump scares are pretty cool. I enjoyed this. Starting off the top five, and surprisingly, all the films in the top five are the big tent pole MCU DCEU type movies. And the first one to kick it off is a film that came out around my birthday this year, Captain Marvel. A film that apparently if you have an opinion on, it's going to be controversial. So we're going back to the 90s with this movie. We have Brie Larson as Captain Marvel, who I really like. I love Brie Larson as an actress. In this movie, though, it felt like she was a little out of her element. And I think a lot of it had to do with the story structure of this movie. Kevin Feige had said, no, we're not 
not going to do any more origin stories. Those have been done to death. We're going to do something different with this film. And what they tried to do was a flashback type story of her trying to recapture her memory. And it actually turned out to be an origin story, but not really because you're like, oh, I don't know if that's true or not. It's just very weird. And I couldn't pinpoint the characteristics of Captain Marvel. At one point she's confused and she's worried and then at the drop of the dime she's dropping quips like Tony Stark. And it kind of comes out of nowhere. It's a little jarring. It is really cool to see Samuel L. Jackson with hair again though. That was pretty neat. And I love the characteristic twist that they have with the scrolls and with the Kree. And this movie has goose. Shush. Adorable little goose. If anything, goose alone makes the top five. In the grand scheme of the MCU, is this one gonna be in like the top five, the top ten? Not even close. It just felt like a movie where, okay, we have this story, we have this character that we want to introduce to everyone before we get to Endgame. So, there you go. Coming in at number four, and I'm going to say this right off the bat right now. Any one of these four, if you have them as your number one superhero movie of 2019, you would get no argument from me. And it pains me that I have to put this film and all the other films below number one, of course, other than number one. But number four, it is Spider-Man Far From Home. Oh, that pains me to put it in at number four, because this movie is awesome. I'll say it right now, my favorite live-action Spider-Man movie of all time. So far. All because of frickin' Tom Holland. He is adorable. I love that dude. And we get an awesome villain with Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio. And I love the choice that they make for Mysterio in this film, making him a visual effects artist and wearing the, the dotted up suit. I love that. But this was our first glimpse of the MCU post Endgame, post all these deaths, after everyone came back. What's the world gonna look like? And I just love the story of Peter Parker here. He is a kid. That's how I always wanted my Spider-Man. He is a kid in high school learning to be Spider-Man, learning to mature, learning to grow up. But sometimes you just need a break. I'm so happy that Disney and Sony, whatever their beef was with each other, they smoothed it all out and we're gonna be getting a third, probably a final film in the MCU Sony trilogy of Spider-Man movies with Tom Holland. Everyone freaked out for those couple of weeks when Spider-Man was no longer in the MCU. It's like, guys, chill out. It's gonna happen. Just let them negotiate. This film had great humor. I laughed so much in this movie. And the end surprise cameo was fantastic. It's rare that I actually applaud for something that happens in a movie because I know it's a movie screen and they can't hear me. But when that cameo happened, I applauded because that was awesome. Far From Home, my favorite live action Spider-Man. And I'm putting my foot down on that. Fight me. Coming in at number three was such a delightful surprise. SHAZAM! Zachary Levi plays the title role of this kid when he says one magic word becomes this big, bulky superhero dude. And he does an amazing job of showing that youthfulness and that childishness that is very hard to replicate when you're an adult playing a little kid. The movie did not have a huge budget behind it, which I think made the story a lot more contained and a lot more focused. Because we see this orphan's internal struggle to finding where he belongs, which is something that all of us at one point in our life goes through through a crisis in our minds with that concept. Where do I belong? Do I belong with my parents? Do I belong with my family? Do I belong with my wife, my husband, my siblings, my friends? Where do I belong and who do I call my family? But the message of this film is that a home is a home when you call it a home. And I think that is such a powerful concept that when you realize that your family is who you consider to be family. It's not the byproduct of two people having sex in, in a pickup truck in the middle of Nebraska somewhere. Just because you have similar DNA does not make you family. Family is who you call family and is where you call home. This is a very powerful message for adults and for little kids to understand. I'm actually kind of tearing up. Well, we're thinking about that. It's kind of what this movie did. I had a smile on my face. I had watery eyes at points. This film was fantastic. A great movie for the holidays as well. And now at number two, and I am shocked that I am putting this movie here because when I was coming into 2019, I thought for sure this film was going to be number one, and it was actually was number one for a very long time, and I was anticipating doing like, ah, this movie was so awesome, and of course it's going to be number one, I'll do like my top five favorite moments from the film. Surprisingly though, another film came out that I think beat it just slightly, but that doesn't mean that Avengers Endgame wasn't such a fantastic masterpiece that made all the monies in the world. A movie that had so much pressure on it from its predecessor Avengers Infinity War. That scored very high on my 2018 favorite superhero film, if you want to go back and check that one out. This movie could have gone wrong in so many ways, and it 
so doesn't. And actually, surprisingly, this story, it's a very internal story, and it's very depressing, and it's very sad. And as it starts out, it's very slow, because our heroes are dealing with something that we have never seen them deal with before, and that's failure. They didn't stop Thanos in Infinity War, and half of the world, half of the universe, suffered because of it. Which gives us such a great choice from Brothor. He gets depressed, he starts eating, he becomes overweight, he grows out his hair, he stops caring about himself. Starts thinking that he's not worthy. And when he has this conversation with his mom, and his mom says, oh, everyone fails at the person that they're supposed to be, you can only be in charge of who you want to be, or something like that, I'm paraphrasing. Oh, oh god, that's such a powerful statement that all of us could use in our lives. And when he picks up Ymir again, he realizes that even though I failed, and even though I am a shell of the person that I was many years ago, hell, I am still worthy. Speaking of picking up that frickin' hammer, that Captain America sequence was fucking badass. When that hammer flies back and Captain America catches it, I look down the aisle of my movie theater and everyone did this! The biggest fist pump moment of the movie. Well, other than the portals scene, which, by the way, the score, Alan Silvestri, it's fantastic. I haven't stopped listening to it. But the reason why this movie succeeded for me was because it gave me the ending that I have been clamoring for ever since Captain America the First Avenger. We finally got the dance between Captain Steve Rogers and Peggy Carter. <laughs> when the screen dissolved and you started hearing that 50s music, I knew it was about to happen. I'm tapping my wife on the leg. I'm like, it's fucking happening. They're giving me the ending that I want! Tears. Just so many tears, and they're, they're happy tears. Endgame is a great culmination of the last 11 years from this franchise that started off with this small feature that everyone thought, eh, it's probably gonna do okay, it's not gonna do great with Iron Man, and it blows everything out of the water, and it starts this, this huge franchise, this whole global phenomenon that is the biggest franchise in the world right now. If anything, this movie deserves at least a nomination for Best Picture of the Year. Will it win? Probably not, but it deserves, it deserves Best Picture nomination. You gave it to Black Panther, and that's, I mean, it's, it's okay, but come on, Endgame deserves it. So here we are, number one of my favorite superhero comic book movies of 2019, and there's a movie that hasn't appeared on this list yet that was very controversial and actually came out a couple of months ago, a little film called Joker. <laughs> When we're talking about Best Picture nominees, this film deserves it, and it probably deserves the win for it, too. If anything, Joaquin Phoenix deserved the Academy Award for Best Actor. My god, this film, it's all Joaquin Phoenix. There isn't a moment on screen where, where he's not on screen, and if he's not, his presence is definitely felt. This is a psychological thriller. This is a character study of seeing how someone can take a terrible situation and see how they react to it. Are they going to go the, the stereotypical good route and become a good person and find their place in the world, or are they going to go down a chaotic route where maybe they take matters into their own hands and do something that people find to be controversial or evil? That's the whole Batman mythology. Here is a kid that's watched his parents get murdered in front of him by some random person on the street. What did he do? He could have gone the Joker route and become evil and promote chaos amongst Gotham. But no, he chooses the chaotic good route, and he chooses to use his vengeance as motivation to put a stop to all the crime in Gotham City. Joker is just a look at the opposite end of that spectrum. That's what makes Batman and Joker the best hero and villain combination in all of comics and all of storytelling. Two people People on the opposite side of the spectrum that always clash with each other. Just in this film, we don't have the Batman side, it's just 100% Joker. And what Joaquin Phoenix was able to put into this character and put into this character study, and the care and the detail that Tom Phillips put into making this film, it is a masterpiece. It is a slow film, it is an unsettling film, it is a creepy film. It's a movie that, when my wife was done watching it, said that film was fantastic, it was brilliant, and it's a movie that I never want to see again because this whole concept is unsettling. Someone that gets pushed too far or had a terrible upbringing all of a sudden finds the platform to do something about it so that he's able to be seen. That's his biggest problem throughout this film is that he's never seen. He's pushed over. He's walked over. He's, he's slumming it as he's walking up the steps going home. No one notices him. The scene where he tries out his dream of being a stand-up comic 
it's nerve-wracking. It's so painful. It's painful to watch because he has this nervous laugh that he can't control. It comes out of sadness, anxiety. It's his coping mechanism for terrible situations. The man just doesn't think like everyone else stereotypically does. He wants to make people laugh. He thinks he knows what's funny, but it's not what everyone else thinks is funny. I mean, up until the end when we find out what the big joke is. He writes it in his journal, I hope my death makes more sense than when I was alive. Sense being the monetary form of the word. How is it that when these three douchebag, billionaire, rich folk, when they get shot and when they get murdered on a train, everyone freaks out. But if someone like him, a lowlife, a dead pee, someone of the lower class, when they get killed on the street, like everyone is in Gotham City at this time, no one bats an eye. That's what Joker finds funny. And at no point does the director or does the story advocate for someone like that. I'm gonna take this time to talk about the controversy that this film got, because even before this movie came out, there was already an uprising of people saying that this film should not be made because it's advocating for, for people that go out and shoot up joints, that shoot up bars and churches. It's giving them a platform to say that they were justified in what they did. At no point in this movie do they say that or do they justify it? All they are doing is showing a character study and telling this story. It is up to the audiences of how they want to take this information in. And do you know how many theaters and how many places got shot up by people that were dressed up as the Joker after this movie came out? Zero. In fact, this movie made a billion dollars. Everyone saw it. This film hasn't even been released in China. They're not going to release it in China. And it made a billion dollars. Because it's a story that a lot of people want to be a part of. And it's a conversation that a lot of people want to be a part of. And I think what a lot of people's issues with this film is, is that it's causing us to think, or at least listen to those hard questions of, what do we do as a society that may manifest a person like that, that would go and shoot up you know, a train or a church or a bar. It's very easy to see a story come out on the TV or on YouTube or on the radio when another shooting has happened because God knows we have so many in this country. It's very easy to think of those people as just straight out evil. But I am a firm believer of not everyone starts out that way. Am I saying that we're to blame for those idiots that go into churches and bars and shoot up the joint? Absolutely not. Those people, those victims are not at fault at all. I'm just saying that after I saw this movie, I thought to myself, okay, what can I do as a person in my society, in my culture, that could help someone that has these tendencies, that is feeling the way that Arthur was feeling in this movie. What can I do to make them feel welcome so that they don't go down that evil route? And it baffles me. It actually pisses me off that so many people wrote this film off and tried to get it not produced, didn't want it released at all before they even saw it. I'm an advocate for the arts. I think arts need to be promoted in schools and in societies and cultures everywhere. But the fact that there were people out there that were trying to say, yes, you have this piece of art. No, you're not going to produce it. I think th that is absolutely awful. Quite frankly, I think it's a little laughable. All this film did was it told a story and it forced you to ask some hard questions about yourself in how you fit into this society that you live in. I actually got into some Twitter wars and some Facebook wars with people that wanted me to agree with them about how this film shouldn't have been released and I wasn't going to do that. Mainly because when I was talking with them, they all said that they had not seen the film yet. Which, I'm sorry, I will have that dialogue with you if you have seen the movie. But if you're talking to me about a piece of art that you have not seen, that you have not listened to, that you have not gone out of your way to look at, if you're talking to me, if you're evaluating that without even seeing it, I'm sorry, but your point, you don't have a leg to stand on. My point with this is, if you're going to judge art, see the art first and then judge it. It's much easier to have a debate and a conversation between two people if both of you have seen the thing that you're debating. All right, that's me coming off my pedestal. Joker is awesome, should win Best Picture and Best Actor. This film is great. It absolutely deserves to be number one, and that's my list! That's 2019 in a nutshell when it comes to the superhero and comic book films that came out this year. Thank you very much, for everyone, for sticking around. Before you go, if you like what you saw here, please know that I do take recommendations from my subscribers and my fans of films that you want me to review on here. So if you have a film that you want me to review, please leave a comment below this video or go to my Facebook page, my Instagram, or my Twitter. Leave your recommendation there. If I have access to it, I will watch, review it, and give you a shout on the channel. So guys, what did you think of my list? Do you agree? Do you disagree? What is your ranking of the 
the superhero comic book films of 2019, please comment below and let me know. And if you like what you saw here, if you like my take on movies, then hit the subscribe button. It helps me out with growing this channel. And if you have friends, if you have family members that love hearing people talk about movies, gloat on movies, boast on movies, or bash on movies, then send them over my way, have them hit the subscribe button. Thank you everyone for sticking around. I will see everyone in 2020 where we got some more superhero films coming out. We got Black Widow. We got Wonder Woman 84. We got New Mutants. Maybe. That's supposed to have come out in the last several years, and it hasn't. Greg, comment below if you think New Mutants is going to come out in 2020. Yes or no? So I will see everyone next year. In the meantime, be well, be good to each other, and go watch a movie. Take care, guys.